Thank you, Professor Galloway. Um, I was, you know, David Bass was asking me, are you, gonna be, are you scared when you give presentations? And like, you know, are you getting nervous? I'm like, no, I don't get nervous. But I did get nervous at what, you know, he was gonna say before I got up here uh, and see what he said. Uh, but, um, so what I'm gonna do today is sort of talk about, you know, Google Earth as, as one thing, but also the journey of how we got there, and as well as uh, my sort of personal journey of what happened during that time, and sort of give you a context of what was going on when we started the company and how it's changed and what happened and why it was interesting and why it was important and why it was something that really was uh, bigger than any of us would have anticipated. Um, so I think I'll warn you about this presentation is that I went through and it's like, I gotta be at least entertaining and funny a little bit. So I have a lot of cultural references, but I realize the cultural references are from my generation. So if you do not know any of the movies that I say about here or anything, then just pretend to laugh and make me feel good. Uh, so the first one I'll show you is Conan O'Brien. He has a skit called In the Year 2000, uh, and now it's In the Year 3000, but uh, so I'm gonna take you back 10 years, uh, In the Year 2000, uh, and sort of, sort of tell you what's going on and what's happening at that time and sort of take you through the journey from that time and place, which is only 10 years ago, to today uh, and what Google Earth is doing. Um, so, in year 2000, as you know, Bob was saying, uh, Keyhole was started, uh, and you know it was a company that we incubated actually out of a uh, a larger company called Intrinsic. And Intrinsic Graphics was a 3D middleware uh, software company that allowed you to sort of develop a game and then deploy it on PlayStation, Xbox, and so forth. And they had a small demo that allowed you to zoom in from outer space down to your home or down to any place on Earth. Um, and it was a demo, it was just a way to show off their technology, something called clip texture mapping, and they'd done it. Um, and you know, they wanted to sort of do something with it, but their VC said, no, you gotta focus on your core product, you can't do it, and so they spun it off. So they incubated us within uh, their company, and so we sat in this, got one, one cubicle, five of us sat in this one cubicle, and we started this company in 2000. And so at that time, uh, anybody can tell me what this graph is of? Uh, which particular stock market? NASDAQ. NASDAQ. <laughs> so this is the NASDAQ. This is from like mid-90s to today. You can sort of see it's like even now recovered. And we started the company at the beginning of 2000. Where is the beginning of 2000? All the way at the very, very peak of the dot-com boom. So this is the dot-com boom, and this is the dot-com crash. <laughs> and that's when we went out and said, okay, let's start this company and do it. And so when we started it, it all went to you know, just uh, went down a hill. And so it was probably one of the worst times, the hardest times to get funding. And so this sort of gives you a context. We went in there saying we start this company, and it wasn't a traditional web company where you did a website and so forth. It was like a, uh, a client application you downloaded and you had 3D graphics and so forth. And so that was what we were going for. And it's a little bit different, yet it was still internet related and everything. Uh, so that's one thing sort of give you the context of what was going on and the climate. And it was a very tough time for us to survive through this period of time. Uh, but, you know, that's, that's what, what happened in terms of the way things worked out. Uh, this is another graph. Uh, this is broadband access adoption in the U.S. Uh, from 2000 to today. And at the time we started, it was a few percent. So basically, we told everybody at the time, you know what, everybody in the U.S. is going to have broadband access to their home, and this, you know, it's going to be awesome because then you can stream all this data and it'll work and be great. But it's one of those things you gotta believe it'll reach here, which it did, which is, which is a, it's a bet that we made that yeah, broadband will make it and we're gonna bet on that future that as we develop this technology, we're not gonna develop for what's, hap what's available today, which was mainly dial-up, like dominantly dial-up, and that's why AOL is doing well and that's why AOL is not doing so well. Um, and so it's, it's, that was the climate of the time and so that was that bet made. Um, and so that's where we were thinking that it would go that direction and you know, as we see today, it has gone that direction. Um, so this is a Silicon Graphics Onyx 2 Infinite Reality Engine. Uh, he talked about Silicon Graphics. I did an internship there and also eventually worked there. Uh, and this, at the time, for the late 90s-ish, 2000-ish, uh, this was the state of the art of three graphics. It was the biggest, baddest graphics uh, system. Big power was in this small chip, and not only was it in that small chip, it was a thousand times faster. <laughs> so that's another bet you make, say that, you know, you know years from now, the graphics will be on every computer, everywhere. I mean, and there was only in a few laptops, you had to buy this card, and not very many computers had it. 
not even talk about not, uh, laptops. I mean, almost all your laptops today probably have three graphics of pretty decent power, probably as much or more than the infinite reality. Uh, and that's where it was. And if you think about 1000X, this is Moore's Law. And I, I didn't realize Moore's Law was actually doubling of transistors, density of transistors, every two years. And there's a guy, I guess, is one of his associates who actually said, you know, doubling of computing power every 18 months. So Wikipedia helped me that uh, with learning that. And when I looked it up, and this is the graph from Wikipedia, actually. Uh, but if, if you look at 1000X, which is almost you know, 2 to the 8th power, 2 to the 8th power is 1024, which is 8 cycles, and 8 cycles over uh, an 8 cycle every 18 months, it's almost 12 years. So it works out that Moore's Law really did happen, which was computer graphics at the time. When I was in school, 486 was a badass processor. It is no longer today, but it was the one that uh, you wanted. But I only got a 386DX when I was there with one or two megabytes of memory, but that's, on my, that's less than I have on my phone. Um, and so that's where you know, computing power was, and that's what, the, again, projecting out, that's what we were, our, our bet was in terms of going forward for 3D graphics. Uh, I'll show you this. Everybody know who this is? Brad Pitt. And Ocean's Eleven came out around 2000. Uh, and he's the coolest guy, you know, him and George Clooney and, you know, like uh, Don Cheeto with the new Rat Pack, you know, the new Dean Martin, uh, uh, Sammy Davis and uh, Frank Sinatra. And so this was a movie that came out. I love the movie. It was about the coolest guys and they had the coolest things and there were these bank robbers who, you know, whatever, whatever. Um, and so if you look at this picture, the reason why I showed it to you is the phone he's using. So the coolest guy in the guy in the plant and, and it had the, that, that was his phone and that phone was the Motorola Veda, and that was the phone to have at the time, 10 years ago. Now a little click, little thing you put, and it was like black and white thing, and it was small. It was so small that it got made fun of by Ben Stiller <laughs> in Zoolander. <laughs> Zoolander. It's like, oh, that tiny phone, mini phone. So that was the coolness of the time. Uh, but of course, you know, today, it's all iPhone, and again, if you look at this, uh, and just think about what I just talked about, you have three graphics more powerful than the SGI. You have 3G over wireless, not even broadband to the home, that is good, that's better than what we had back in the day uh, 10 years ago. Um, and computing power that is better than whatever we had 10 years ago, on, just on that phone. And of course, Android also. And you see Google Earth there. I'll come back to this in a little bit later down. But that's where the bet was, and it's heading. And so it really just shows you the time and the context by which you started the company. Uh, and this is a context of me, I just, as, I, as Bob said, I was just graduated from Duke at the time, uh, done, this is actually me over on the right hand side. Um, this is, you know, the real time 3D ultrasound machine that I worked on, and it's the poor guy getting his picture taken with his shirt off. Uh, but, uh, but this was, I was doing 3D graphics, and I was, not 3D graphics, but 3D ultrasound and medical imaging, and my degrees, both undergrad and PhD, were on biomedical engineering. And so that was, uh, what I was doing, and now I was going to go into this, you know, new dot-com sort of, you know, internet world of uh, 3D graphics. And the thing that tied it together for me, I was thinking, like, what is it this through line for all my things that I've done is that I do love working on big problems, things that are very hard to solve, and working with very big data and lots of data. And how do you manage all that data given the resources you have, whether it be limited bandwidth, limited memory, limited disk resources, and how does that all work together to create a great experience to visualize this data. And 3D graphics has been something I've always loved. Even this day, I took the ultrasound machine and uh, ultrasound data from this real-time uh, ultrasound machine and you know, did the fourth volume renderings of it and on the silicon graphics machines. Um, and so this is the people that started the company. Uh, it's Avi, uh, Kirsten, Mark Aubin, um, Phil Kustlin, and me. And one of the guys on the picture because he's closing the round of uh, funding. Uh, that you know, helped us get funding in 2001, at the, of course, the, the, the worst time you could get funding. And this is the day we moved from that cubicle uh, to our offices uh, down, down in a different part of town, uh, and we were all packing our stuff up. Um, and you'll see throughout a lot of the story is that it was very scrappy, it was very much you get your hands dirty. It wasn't like someone else does the moving for you, you hire someone else to do it, or you hire someone else to do this, or whatever. Everybody did everything. In a startup, you, everything is, there's nobody that's gonna do it for you, so you have to do it yourself. Whether it be setting up cubicles, setting up the network, you know, setting up mail servers, whatever it was, everybody did everything and whatever it took to make the company run. Um, and this was the product we built. This was like one of the first ones. This actually happens to be the NVIDIA, sort of one we did with the partnership. But the idea was that we want to take all this imagery that was out there publicly, from the USGS to commercial satellite companies to commercial aerial companies that had photos of the world, and it was only accessible by um, these very expensive, complex systems uh, like Esri, uh, Arc, ArcGIS, and 
other kind of tools to be able to use this data and, and be able to you know, benefit from this data. Um, and so the idea was, was to take that, the data and technology, plus 3D graphics and the accessibility of that, and bring it to everybody. Not just people who had the skills and the tools and the, and the money to buy these big machines, but anybody who could actually just open up a laptop and you know, use it. Um, and so that was sort of the dream, and this is sort of the, the, the pro version we sold, and it's like you know, one of the taglines we used from, we quote from the New York Times, was for anyone who's dreamed of flying. It really was like flying across the world and sort of seeing it, um, and, and, and sort of you know, having that experience. So I show this because this is not what we had. <laughs> you think of data centers, you think of like Google, and you think of everything, it's like all oh, these racks and servers, this is much they have this, you had the funding, you went out and bought these servers, and all these nice zip-tied cables and everything else, and that was uh, not what we had. I just show this for contrast, because I think about it, and like, you think about these cool data centers, especially today when you read about Google's big data centers and so forth. This was ours. We had... <laughs> We, were scra we took any server anywhere, whatever tasks we had, we had uh, the old, these, you know, I don't think you guys ever remember, maybe you guys do, but there used to be CRTs that actually were bigger, they weren't flat, they were much, much bigger, they were as long as they were tall. Uh, we had those everywhere, and like, you know, keyboards and hanging out, uh, cables, so we see little zip ties, it looks kind of nice. Um, there's the servers here. This particular thing, the Cisco router, we, one of the other companies that our VC had invested in uh, was shutting down, so we went over to their offices and just picked through and said, okay, we'll take that, 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 and took it back and stuck it in our data center. This is the one that actually, uh, where it served all our data, and this actually happened to be in a, in a back room in a garage uh, somewhere. So it wasn't the fancy sort of above net stuff, but it was in this back room. Uh, some more pictures of that. Uh, this is our, where we processed our data, some more stacks of servers. Um, you know, wires not so nice. Uh, and this is our, uh, the RAID array that we use to uh, hold the data. And I think each one is is two to four terabytes, I can't remember. Uh, and, and they, um, so we use a store that is all just disks and stuff. Uh, whereas my laptop today is a quarter terabyte solid state drive. And again, it's kind of contrasting the time. Uh, and so the thing that really took us off, so that's the beginning, and it started in 2000 or so. And in March 21st, 2003, we went to war with Iraq. Uh, and before that, CNN and ABC News had used their stuff every once in a while, but when the war hit, they used us every hour. So we were on CNN all the time, everybody was seeing it, and this is how they told the story of the war, where the tanks were going, and what was going on, and what was being bombed, and it exploded for us. We, it was so much traffic that we had to shut it down for the night uh, because we just couldn't handle the traffic and go to this place. This is, a very, this is a place, Fried Electronics. This is a very famous Silicon Valley sort of place, and that night, I said, we got to build more servers. So we went out to Fry's, <laughs> got a little shopping cart, and start filling it up with hard drives and everything, uh, and stuck it in the back <laughs> of the car. <laughs> so it's so a one story about, uh, and this actually is an SLK. It's a tiny ass car. This guy who has this is like a six foot five guy, and he has this tiny, but he likes these kind of cars. Um, and so it's like all the dry stuff. But the one story about this place, and just to give you an anecdote, is that it is like geek heaven. You come out of your hole, you've been hacking away all night, and so you need to get some stuff. You go to the store, buy the latest software, buy your chips, and the way out, there's junk food, toothpaste, deodorant, and you go away back to your hole and start hacking away. <laughs> so that's what it was. I'm not sure how it was to them in there in a while, but it's just one of those places you hear about. So you just gotta go to Fries Electronics. Um, so, it, so it was usual. This actually is a more recent one. So I'll play this video just because I think it's, it's a great, thing that, you know, when we saw it, it was like, oh my God, you know, we just saw Google Earth on CSI. Did they have permission to use it? No. We've got to go talk to them. And then, like, you know, it went on ABC News. And so this is a clip, actually, of more recent stuff, but just to give you a sense of, um, of what was, was going on at the time. Um, let me play it real quick. Um, Google Earth image of the port before the earthquake hit. And now I want to show you an image of it afterwards. Uh, this is a Google Earth shot of some of the area, you know, Tour de France. This is Google Earth or the DSS. Not knowing exactly where the worst of the destruction has been and which roads and bridges are left open is crucial to any effort. 
Google Earth satellite images of the spill from space. Well, this is a product that we're using that kind of combines Google Maps and also the NOAA. When I do a Google Earth map, I can actually draw the outline of the oil slick and get the square mileage. The folks at Google Maps have come up with a way to see how big this is. When you look at that oil spill, lift it up all those thousands of square miles and place on top of the area of our nation's capital. The Google Earth projection that shows the slick big enough to cover Washington, D.C. and reach into parts of five neighboring states. All right, so that's sort of, that was sort of what, was, this is more recent, of course, with the Haiti earthquake and the oil spill, but people were using it to tell stories. And I'll go more into those different stories. There's so many different dimensions in that, and I'll probably go into each one fairly you know, in more detail, but it was pretty amazing. You watch that, and it's like, oh my God, they're using our stuff to tell these stories in a way that really is accessible. And not only that, it's not just what they can use. Someone just go home and just look at themselves. And so it was, it's pretty impactful. Plus, you know, having John Stewart talk about Google Maps is pretty cool, too. Um, so this guy, anybody know who this guy is? Sergey Brin. Sergey Brin, the, one of the co-founders of Google. He uh, gets the big, this is 2003 was when the Iraq war happened, probably around the beginning of 2004-ish. He decided to download our software <laughs> and play around with it. And I, I actually had this conversation with his wife once and said, hey, you know, you know, she said, like, we just loved it. We downloaded it, we'd go around, fly around it, and he just totally loved the software. And the story goes that I hear, uh, you know, I wasn't there because they were talking about it, is that some guy went to, it was his first time, I think, presenting to Larry Sergey and the board and Eric Schmidt and stuff, uh, and, and is going to present this idea that we should buy this company. And so he goes up, does his presentation. In the middle of the presentation, Sergey had been sort of surfing the net and turns around on his laptop and says, you know, we should buy this company. And it was Keyhole Earthier on the laptop. Uh, and so the whole conversation got shifted to that. <laughs> the poor guy, like, you know, he's, the, he's just trying, it's his first time, he gets completely sort of sidetracked. And they talk about that. And around April or so of that year, we ended up talking with them. And we thought we'd go in and sort of talk about collaboration ideas and so forth. Uh, and we had we're just about to close a round of funding with Menlo Park Ventures. It was probably a great term sheet, it was awesome, and we're gonna go off into the next phase of the company. And at the end of that first meeting, uh, Megan Smith came uh, to John, our CEO, and said, hey, we think we might wanna buy your company. Uh, and so the whole start of dialogue, is right when Google went IPO, IPO that, that summer, and so that was going on as we're in discussions for acquisition. And so by October 2004, we got acquired. Uh, it was a time that, it's something I would not have predicted a year before, a little, maybe a little before a year, uh, that we would be in the state where we would get acquired and things would turn out okay. And there were so many companies at the time, they were closing a shop and they had great technology but just didn't work out either for luck or something. But we somehow persisted through the years and got to the point uh, that we got acquired by Google, which was an amazing sort of event. In some ways, for me, it was a more grateful than anything else that we actually worked, things worked out and everybody's hard work and all the money that people invested turning out to be, you know, working out for everybody, which was great. And so this is us, and it's kind of blurry pictures because, you know, I think the guy who took that one, Brian, uh, didn't have good ones. It's like me, John, and Sarcio, and then Mark, um, us hanging out, you know, drinking beers, drinking uh, champagne. <laughs> uh, and this is me, I actually was actually uh, out, uh, getting, taking the data from our data centers and moving it to Google because as soon as they announced it, it would be going, going crazy. So we had to get a, uh, build up a brand new infrastructure and so I was taking our machine, sticking it in our network, loading all the information, driving that machine over to their uh, network, plugging it in and loading up the data and I was going back and forth doing that. We had multiple terabytes of data so it, was, it, was, it, just, it took a, a decent amount of time. Uh, and you can sort of see John saying, oh, what the hell is he talking about? Uh, but uh, I, we were sitting there talking to the, to the group, and I just come back, I think, in this picture, and I was actually over at Google um, sort of working. They had a nice Orangina, and I had a Starbucks, and it was, life was good. Uh, so this is when we got acquired, and this is the day they announced it to the company, uh, and we decided at the end of the day, this is something called TGIF, uh, where every Friday they um, get together and just talk about the week and what's going on, and the new Googlers come in and sort of introduced, uh, and some, you know, Michael Jones, one of the co-founders of the company, went on top of the roof uh, over the Googleplex and took this picture, uh, and that's me right there, uh, <laughs> and this mass of people. Um, it's kind of hard to find, it's like, where am I? Uh, but uh, at this time, Google's about 2,000 or so people, uh, and today's about 20-some thousand people, so it's definitely grown a lot uh, in, the, in the past, since we acquired back in 2004. 
Um, so life at Google. So I'm going to sort of tell you a whole bunch of stories and some events and stuff and what it happened and what it went, went through. Um, this is me, of course, uh, and this is when we launched satellite imagery on Google Maps. Google Maps actually was a part of a different acquisition from a company called where to Tech. Uh, and they, Lars and Jens, uh, created Google Maps. And one of the first things we did to integrate the two, Keyhole and the Maps, Google Earth and the Maps stuff, and at the time, it actually wasn't called Google Earth, it was still Keyhole. We had an action rebrand, I'll tell you about that in a second, uh, was to get satellite imagery that we had and put it onto the Maps application. And that launched in you know, April of 2005, and it was a huge launch. Uh, we had just had only road data in you know, uh, city locations, city points, uh, city locations and borders and stuff only in the US, uh, but we had satellite imagery in Europe and other places. And so when we launched satellite imagery, people actually still went over to Europe and digged down with no road data or anything to find stuff. And it's, a, it's an amazing international response, uh, given that we had data everywhere. Um, and so if you notice this guy in the back, this guy is Brett Taylor, who also started Maps, and who is actually, just as an anecdote, now the CTO of Facebook. Um, so another thing that happened, um, it, was, it wasn't just a technological sort of response. You know, this great technology, all this terabytes of data that's accessible to everybody, but it was a cultural response. It was just people loved it, just viscerally loved what we were doing. And this was a Foxtrot cartoon that sort of made sort of, uh, uh, sort of a, a whole strip uh, about satellite maps. And it wasn't just one, two, or three. It was an entire week of satellite imagery uh, sort of jokes about us. Uh, and we can see that. Even like, later on, there was like one on The Simpsons and stuff. So it was just a response that everybody sort of reacted to in a way that was just cultural. Everything sort of came up uh, in that response. And at one point in time when this launch, we were looking at CNN's top stories, and we were the number two story. I mean, eventually we became number one, but at one point we were number two story, and we were above the Pope, yet we were below Michael Jackson. Uh, so we're in this kind of weird juxtaposition between these stories of people, but it was just like we looked at that, and it was kind of a, an amazing thing. Uh, Google Earth then launched that summer. Uh, it was rebranded Google Earth, that's what you guys know today. And so it happened about almost about a, a nine months after acquisition, uh, and we launched this as the old UI. Was, uh, thank God for Google and the internet, because all these pictures I just found by searching, because I didn't have any of them. <laughs> and I was like, I gotta find a picture of the old UI that we first launched with Google Earth, and this is what we had, um, and, and we launched the, the product. Um, and so with that, we, had a lot of people, I mean, that was also an amazingly huge launch. Everybody used it and it was just, you know, it was crazy. Uh, uh, and, and a lot of people came in and wanted to integrate with us and do stuff with us and, and put their data with ours from National Geographic, clearly well-respected magazine, to say we're gonna take every magazine, uh, every cover of our magazine and geolocate every single one of them and put them on a map. And so all those, those uh, the, the golden triangles are you know, where the story took place uh, for that particular you know, issue of National Geographic. In addition, you see all these little red planes. Those are actually uh, from this guy, uh, Michael Fay, who uh, took an ultralight to Africa, rode an ultralight with the camera, the DSLR camera pointed down in a GPS and just flew all around Africa. This is an amazing sort of, you know, just sort of expedition the guy did and he took pictures. And so then we integrated those pictures and had seals on beaches to hippos and uh, sort of, and then buffalo removing the planes and, and like, and, uh, and uh, also, you know, uh, elephants in the fields and sort of integrate that data to this high resolution. So all this stuff came up. Discovery Channel integrated all their shows and put them geolocated. Uh, Travel and Leisure did all the top 500 hotels and put it in Google Earth. Uh, and you know, even Pirates of the Caribbean came out and said, let's do a Google Earth sort of cool game. And so they, they came in and they did this cool game where you, you know, they put a fake sort of island of the, of the crossbone sort of uh, face and made a game out of this uh, for Google Earth. So it's again a cultural thing as well as just everybody's loving what the platform was built on. Um, but along with all this was a little more, I guess, serious side, a little more other impact which to me, it's always it had also a strong meaning for us. Uh, was that Hurricane Katrina hit uh, the summer, I guess, late summer of the same year that we launched Google Earth? And when it happened, um, the response from everybody in the team was, "We've got to get imagery from our image data providers, Digital Globe, uh, and everybody, and get this imagery out there as soon as possible, and take the imagery they're flying and putting it online so people can use it." 
And so it was one of those things where it wasn't a planned group, there wasn't an emergency response group, it was just people saying, we've got to do the right thing and get this data out there so they can use it to help people. Uh, and so we did that and worked with you know, uh, the you know, government agencies and the Coast Guard and so forth, and they used it to you know, save lives. They sent us, uh, sort of uh, left a phone message telling us how much they appreciated what we did. Uh, and, and it was, it was you know, the work was recognized, the whole team was recognized by the NGA or the, uh, yeah, NGA. And so it was an amazing thing. And this has continued over the years. When the Pakistan earthquake hit, when the tsunami hit, uh, when all of these things happened, we went out and got imagery to help them uh, provide a platform by which they can sort of plan their activities. And there's no real structured thing they had at the time. And so, you know, having us do it was just kind of weird that, you know, the government would be sort of organized and sort of figure out how to do it, but we provided that platform to make that happen. Um, as well as, in a, a little bit later, and sort of jump around this sort of theme, is that Darfur happened, crisis in Darfur. Uh, and, you know, they talked to us about, you know, how do we get visibility to what's going on in Darfur. And so the, we worked with the satellite companies again to bring satellite imagery of all the places around there. One, to actually show what's going on, as well as track what was going on, uh, you know, in terms of the, just the horrific events that were happening there. And you see these little small circles. These are actually burned huts. Uh, this is the picture actually from the uh, New York Times uh, about the scorched earth strategy that the, they're having about sort of eradicating these people. So it was, you know, we were involved with that in terms of what's going on. Bahrain, you think of Bahrain today, protests going on. Uh, and you know, all the uh, sort of the stuff going on in the Middle East. Well, back in August of 2006, they shut off Google Earth. And the reason why they shut off Google Earth was um, that they had used it, uh, the people of Bahrain used it, to look at the lavish palaces. This happens to be the palace of the king's uncle, this, which is an island, which is kind of crazy, your house is an island, uh, but that's what they had. And they own like 95% of the land, almost all the coastlines owned by the royal family, and the people saw this, and, they, and the royal family did not like it, and so they shut off the door. Eventually they turned it back on, uh, but there was a, you know, a way for information to help people uh, you know, with that information. So it was kind of amazing to see this happen that, you know, I think some actually elections happen and things change, but, um, you know, things are different still what's going on today, but this, this event was like, whoa, what's, you know, this was used for in a way that we didn't expect. Um, another one that happened, this was actually from the map side, my maps uh, was the application we did to say, hey, you know what, here's a map, you can put points on it and, you know, say, here, let's meet here, here's the places you need to go for wedding events, and, you know, here's hiking trails and stuff. And that's what we built it for, for anybody to do anything they want with a map. Uh, in this particular place, when the San Diego fires happened in October 2007, they used it to track what was going with the fire, where the fire line was, where uh, emergency places were to go to for help, and it just sort of happened. Some guy at the PBS station in, uh, in San Diego said, hey, let's use this map to do that, uh, to, to organize this, and it sort of exploded and sort of became a use that you know, we didn't plan for. As well as today, I was just looking at this, um, just this month, they created a Libya map to sort of do the same thing. Uh, and so this continued on to be used. Um, another thing that happened, uh, and these are all stories more in the, in the sort of meteor stuff versus just the fun stuff. Someone, and this is kind of a funny story, and what happened afterwards is kind of interesting also, is that some guy, when we launched Google Earth, this computer programmer, I'm sure there's some guy geek going through and says, oh, let's look at my town. It's a small town in Italy. And sort of looking around this town in Italy. And eventually he found this little rectangular area. He said, what's this near, you know, in my small town in Italy? And he dug in and said, you know what? I think this is a Roman villa. So he called this like, city and said, hey, we look into this. And they went out, looked at it, and it truly was a Roman villa. Some guy had accidentally found an undiscovered Roman villa in his small town in Italy. Um, and it was like, whoa, what, how did that happen? Like, it just, it, it, just, it was incredible to see, like, this, this, uh, this imagery being used for archaeology. And so some guy, NC State, um, and, and uh, Scott Madry went and said, okay, what's, how did you do this for archaeology? So they went out and said, okay, I'm going to, he think you started this, like, uh, ancient places in, in southern France. And he went out and did this and found 200 some sites, went to France and verified. And he actually did verify. He said, yes, you could really use this for what's termed now, I guess, as armchair uh, archaeology. And just this past month, I read an article that said 2,000 potential sites in Saudi Arabia. You really can't walk into Saudi Arabia and say, oh, I'm going to go look for archaeological sites. But you can go to Google Earth and look around and see uh, what's going, you know, potential sites, and so it's still being used today. So you have this one guy who accidentally found it, sort of continued that on. Um, this is another one where Australian scientists went through and they 
Uh, he's, uh, I guess, a, a marine biologist, and he, there's this thing called fringing coral reefs that's extremely rare and happens only in certain places, in arid regions that I know have uh, air going out to, to the ocean. Uh, and he was looking around in Google Earth uh, and found this, the largest sort of formation of these fringing coral reefs. And that is really his comment, like, I hear an Australian voice in my head, it says, I feel like, bl like bloody Charles Darwin up here discovering these new reefs. And he had this experience of like, being able to discover the world just from his desktop. Um, and, and Russell recently, this is another one that came up, and it's like this lost world we discovered. And there's two of them, one in Mozambique and one in, uh, in, in Myanmar, not Myanmar, but the, also, sorry, Madagascar. And basically, they found a place on Earth that men had never been to, uh, just by looking at and knowing, uh, because people have looked at satellite imagery before, just never had access to everything. Uh, and they did, and they were able to go out these expeditions and find new insects and species and so forth that was out there. And so you look at all this, and what people did with it, you could never have predicted all the stuff I just talked about, archaeology to science to marine biology to all this stuff. And the, the amazing thing is that when uh, we went to Sergei and said, hey, here's what we want to buy in terms of the imagery. So we just want these major cities because it's the best place to place by imagery. Sergei looked at it and said, you know what? No, I want you to buy all the imagery. You just buy everything from this company. And it wasn't just like, just get a few places and just do what's business and makes sense of what's the, what can you achieve that's even bigger than that. And so the goal has been to cover the entire earth with submeter imagery. I think we've got like 40, 50% of the land servers uh, today but to cover it with this imagery. And whatever the people do with it is what happens. And so as I look at this and reflect on it, I think that it's not necessarily what we built or the technology that was developed, but what people did with it, what people did with it afterwards. They did so many amazing things, and even today they're doing stuff we, I just, it's amazing, it still amazes to me what they did. And so what the people and what other people did with that platform, with that data, by making that information accessible, making that something that people can use, so many things came out of that, and that truly was amazing. And I just go back to this iPhone, and it's, it really is this embodiment. I first saw it, I was like, oh my God, the dream that we had 10 years ago, whenever, eight years ago, when you saw this, uh, came true. You know, 3G, you know, wireless internet, computer graphics on your phone, you know, almost like a Star Trek type interface. Uh, and it was like magic, like, you know, it's like magic is really, it was really like magic on your phone to fly around the earth on the phone. Um, and so it was it, it somewhat embodied to me what we had dreamed up you know, so long ago. And with the help of Google and its infrastructure and its reach, we really did you know, turn into that, you know, realize that vision. Um, so I'll talk about some other stuff now. Uh, it's more fun and different things and little stories. And so this is all the serious stuff. So just go through and, and it really did, it did some meat and essence to it that I think it was really important. But one day, uh, I think it was July, in, in, in 2005, I found this note on my, on my uh, uh, computer screen. And it's one of the guys, uh, he's a, he was an old time Googler. He actually worked in Larry Sergey's garage back in the day. So this happened, my first time happened. But this note on my, uh, on my computer, it says, can we launch moon.google.com on July 20th with a logo? A logo meaning with a Google Doodle. And the date was July 13th. Only reason I remember that is we both had the same birthday. <laughs> this was a week later, like seven days later. So, so I said, ah, I got some data from Moon that I downloaded one of the key old days. Let's do it. Can we do it? Oh, sure, let's do it. So I included a couple of the guys, and we did it, and we launched Moon uh, a week later. <laughs> and so this is Moon. And I said, ah, oh, we, we, okay, we got to put in the bottom layer cheese. And so when you zoom all the way in, the Moon's made out of cheese. Uh, people love this. It was amazing. It was like, we love the cheese. The cheese is so awesome. <laughs> Uh, but like that was what we launched. And then the crazy thing was someone in support emailed us and said, hey, I got this email from Neil Armstrong's assistant uh, and he saw it and he was really pleased and loved it. And I was like, whoa, this was like a, the day it launched. And then the next day, the quarry early has come out. And imagine, realize this is a one week project which sort of came out with a post note on my door. It said, you know, Schmitz, Google delivers profit. Moon Journey <laughs> on Forbes. This is a Forbes article about Google after the earnings. And we're like, whoa, this is ridiculous that this could happen. And that kind of environment it gives you sort of, the, sort, of the, sort of the example of what it was like at Google at the time in 2005, where there's so much innovation and creativity and just the openness to allow things to happen. I mean, it really was, a, in some ways, uh, an incredible environment to be in. And it's somewhat still today to have this environment where you can just create and be supportive and launches and just things like this happen. And so after that, some guys in Arizona, a couple of um, scientists in Arizona who actually had sent the Mars rover and designed all the, the vehicles, 
uh, and sent them to Mars, uh, they sort of got in contact with me and said, hey, let's do Mars. We have all this imagery, let's do Mars. So then they came over and they launched Mars. Mars then turned into 3D with Google Earth at some point in time, and we had Google Mars and Google Earth in 3D. Uh, there's Google Sky that we took all the entire sky and mapped out the entire sky with super resolution and, and from all the different uh, telescopes around the world and mosaic them all together, almost to the Google Earth for the sky. And you can see galaxies zoom in and you can see, actually see that all these stars, they're not really stars, they're galaxies. It's amazing to see as you zoom in, it's just stunning that it's not, it's, it's just the detail and what's out there that makes you believe like, there are billions and billions of galaxies, not just stars that are out there. Uh, and then uh, we went to the News Museum. Actually, someone was, uh, actually, Doc, Dean Galloway, as I mentioned, I should go down to the News Museum, uh, to the new library, and there's like the new stuff that's set up there. And at the News Museum, we launched Google Moon with, in 3D with some data. Buzz Aldrin was there, and a, and a bunch of people, uh, James Cameron gave it a thing. And so from that small little post it note, <laughs> uh, through just different people who saw it, and then that they came over and tried different ideas, it grew into this huge planetary stuff. And this was all 20% time. It's all stuff we did because we loved it, because we wanted to do it, not because we were told to do it, it was our job, or this is what we had to do for this week, and it was on some engineering schedule. We just loved it. And there was that freedom to do that sort of stuff, that sort of, let's try this, and do it because you truly loved you know, science and, and, and astronomy and what was going out in terms of space. Um, so even more fun stuff. April 1st, 2006. This is when we did our first uh, April Fool's joke within Google Earth. And this is in Area 51 in a base around there. We decided to put a little alien there. <laughs> and we put that in. So that we did a Google like, sort of April Fool's joke every year. Uh, somebody went over and did KFC uh, uh, Colonel Sandals face in the middle of the and this is not us pasting it in. Somebody, KFC, I think, actually sponsored getting this actually uh, made out in the desert and just built this gigantic Colonel Sanders face. Um, somebody, some artist in Canada, said, hey, it wouldn't be cool to put Waldo on top of a roof and we'll do a, a real world Waldo game. And so they went out in Vancouver, put a Waldo on top of the roof. <laughs> Uh, and they went through and said, okay, well, the, the, the problem was, they said, when does Google you know, update the imagery so this will get in the database? And this inspired other people in other towns to do it and put Waldo on the, on the roofs. Um, Oprah Winfrey in the middle of Arizona. Who would have guessed? Someone etched out and created a maze of Oprah Winfrey's face in Arizona. And stuff like this is everywhere. There's like, will you marry me? All this stuff everywhere. And there's even crop, well, this, this is actually, this is a giant pink bunny. It's one of my favorite ones. I was like looking out, I was like, why is there a 300 foot giant pink bunny in northern Italy? <laughs> and some artists, I guess artists love these kind of things to sort of envision the craziness of the world and make it happen. And this is the picture, actual picture of it in the middle of Italy. We actually looked and said, can we actually see it? And there it was, the giant pink bunny in our database. Uh, and I think there are, if you look on the internet, you'll find actually how big this is, uh, ungodly big in terms of how big that is. Uh, but I was going to get to also, but Crop circles, they really do, they're in there, in the database. People ask, like, oh, maybe it's just myth and it's, it's just uh, whatever. Uh, and maybe, you know, it's like, maybe the aliens really did come down. And you see these all over the UK. It's, 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 uh, it's amazing. Someone went through and found every single one. I don't know why people have the time to just go through all our database and look at and find every single one. But some people found every single one. So maybe it's aliens, maybe, maybe not. And I saw this one. It's like, ah, <laughs> maybe not. Maybe not. Maybe it's really some guy who has pointed out screwing people's minds uh, and stuff. There's a Pac-Man in the middle of nowhere. Um, so I'll end with this. This is going to sort of wrap up the conversation. This is actually a, a picture from an article I found. I was looking at it because the one thing that amazed me as I went through these remote sensing conferences, I talked at this conference uh, about Google Earth, and it's the remote sensing is where they talk about the satellites that actually take the image and stuff, and they talk about it. And every person that came up and talked and gave a speech said, hey, you know, my five-year-old used Google Earth to do this. And the fact that the stuff we built was so accessible by just even a five-year-old. I remember being at the tech museum and we set up some stuff, booths there to sort of show them our technology. And this four or five-year-old was just playing with it with his mouth and using it. And this is something just five years, 10 years ago, five, 10 years ago, only a trained PhD person with tens of thousands of equipment could do. And now here's a four or five-year-old kid do it. Uh, and this particular one, the guy was actually, uh, I think it was called, um, like. I don't know, like dirt cheap babysitting or whatever. How do you have a cheap sort of uh, entertain your kids cheaply or for free? And he basically sat down with his kid with his iPod Touch. Again, you know, this technology wasn't a computer, and showed him Google Earth and took him around the world. Uh, and so, as I think about my son, who's about to turn one this Sunday, 
you know, it really is amazing that we brought this stuff to that level that it is accessible and it's become ubiquitous. Everybody's there. If people want to see a map, they expect style imagery. You can't ha see a have a map today. <clears throat> and the time it was crazy. They did it and it's like, oh, nobody will use it. It's not useful and it, you shouldn't do it. And we did it and it became something that's de facto now for, for maps today. Um, and so I think this is the last picture. This is me, circa 1990. About when you guys, when you were freshmen in here, around the time I graduated, I looked like a dork, glasses, you know, this gray 80s jacket. It, this is actually grad night uh, when I graduated. And I think about, I was thinking about you guys coming in. I mean, you guys, at least the undergraduate, uh, is at the same stage I was then uh, as I look at you guys. So it's almost, you know, 10 to almost 20 years since I started as a freshman at Vanderbilt. And thinking about what's going to happen between now and then. When I was that age, I was thinking, okay, you know, I'm going to get a PhD, become a professor in research, and that was my path. And I really thought that was what I was going to do when I grew up. Uh, but as you saw, it went a very, very different direction. You know, I went from that to, you know, did my PhD in it to, you know, doing silicon graphics, which was sort of related with scientific visualization, to the internet, to Google, and which you see today. And it really was, was this journey that. I could never, at that age or at that time, predict what's going to happen. Uh, and so as I look at you guys, you know, I think that you, know, you think about what is it you're going to do when you grow up, and what is it, how you plan for it, and what do you shoot for. I think a lot of what your Vanderbilt education is doing today is sort of giving you the tools to sort of allow you to take that journey to be able to succeed in those situations. Opportunities come up, you figure out a way to take advantage of them, no matter what they are. They may not fit totally. Uh, but I think that you know, it's, it'll be amazing to see which one of you guys come back and sort of give this talk 20 years from now uh, and talking about what you guys did and changed the world and sort of you know, brought a new technology to, to, um, to you know, people all around the world. Um, and so I want to say thank you for inviting me over here. It's been great. Uh, I really do appreciate it. It's been great to come back to campus and see what's changed and what's not changed. If you want to talk to me and have questions, this is my email, chakai at google.com, pretty easy to remember. And if you really want to know about the minutiae of my life, pictures of my kid, pictures, like articles I like, you can follow me on Twitter at LifeFC. So thank you very much.